All right, let's get going. Happy Friday. How's everybody? Moving along? All right. Have you introduced yourself to the homework? Yes. How does it look after this introduction? Gentle introduction. Okay. <laughs> yes. So part, the, the homework is really practicing how to calculate things because you will need that. Now, we did spend in class quite a bit of time explaining what all of the shear strength components are and what physically they mean. And then now you need to learn how to use calculus tools to simply compute things. And then hopefully that kind of clicks together because the calculating uh, and visualizing fields is just the means to, to actually get and solve the problems. So basically the, there, there are three problems in the homework uh, and they have like various velocity distributions. Uh, first one is just example of velocity distributions for anything. Um, any field that is depending on X and Y, you could interpret as a velocity field of some kind uh, or a field in general and then you can basically go and uh, calculate what stresses could be uh, in that field and then there are two relatively familiar examples of uh, thin pla the, the, the problems uh, of a Newtonian fluid and non-Newtonian shear thinning fluid in between two plates where you get the velocity distribution and again, you're supposed to examine the problem. You have a velocity distribution and you, you're you wondering, well, where are the shear stresses minimal? Where are the shear stresses maximal? And that's important because the fluid does exert stress on equipment. And if you have, for instance, water constantly running in pipes, that's also those water or different other fluids that's constantly affecting uh, those pipes, right? And you need to basically calculate uh, what that shear stress is. Okay? And the, we're gonna, uh, uh, and what the total force that the fluid uh, is exerting on the solid faces are. So again, if you want to, if the question is about asking what the force is on some solid, then you need to multiply or integrate the total sh stress over the area or if it's constant on that solid, then you just multiply by the area. Is that understood from the physical perspective? So the question might ask you about the total force on something. When you have total force on a solid, you have to integrate the stresses over an area. If the stress is constant on that area, then you just multiply the shear stress times area. Otherwise, you actually have to run the full integral. Or the question might be, what are the, what are the stresses, right? So th there are different ways to pose the questions. All right. So just a quick reminder before we move on, uh, because we are going to actually put uh, our stress tensors to use today in a problem. So first things first, if, if I don't have fluid moving at all, what are the stresses that I have in the fluid? What's, what is stressing a fluid at rest? Gravity. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it is. <laughs> but if that fluid is resting, I will always have thermodynamic pressure. And yes, gravity this could be incorporated or hydrostatic pressure because of gravity can be incorporated into P as well. So this is something that shows up regardless of the movement. Now, if we understand that stresses can act in all kinds of directions, pressure always acts normal to any surface that it's next to. So there are no shear components. And basically, that, that's true for coordinate surfaces as well. So if I was thinking of expressing that same pressure or that same stress uh, due to hydrostatic uh, 
pressure. As a tensor, I would basically put a same component P in all coordinate directions and zero for all shear, right? So basically then I get a tensor. This is really P times identity matrix. And we have um, denoted this the ma uh, identity matrix as delta underscored, right? So this is my pressure component. <coughs> And these are my shear stresses. Okay? So in a general field or a general velocity field, I will have velocity differences pretty much in all directions. Okay? So I will have velocity changing in all directions and I will have gradients of velocity existing in all directions. So in that case, we are looking at a full stress sensor. For instance, if I'm thinking about the momentum transfer, what does tau xx stand for? What is it? What is it in terms of momentum transfer? How do we think about it? It's a, which momentum am I transferring across which plane? Say my x direction is orthogonal to this. Right? My fluid has all kinds of directions, so the velocity has an x component, and therefore I have x momentum. That x momentum can be transferred across x plane, and tau xx is the transfer of x momentum across x plane, and it's normal stress by itself. Okay. When I move over to tau xy, across that same place, plane x, I'm transferring now y component of the velocity or y component of the momentum. Okay. So my y momentum is transferred across x plane. And this is now, so since y direction is orthogonal, let's say that it is in this direction, it's orthogonal to this plane, then my tau uh, xy is a shear stress. Right? So it's shearing this plane. And then similarly, tau xz, right? So it's the other shear stress. So that's why I need the entire, entire uh, uh, tensor or matrix to actually describe how all of the momenta are transferring across all of the possible planes. Three by three is uh, is nine. So that is my total molecular stress tensor. So those are what we refer to as molecular stresses. I have also simply stress that quite literally just flows into the domain. Now, when we have fluid flow in that same velocity field, if I put a plane anywhere, really, the only component of that velocity that goes through that plane is normal to it. So I can split any vector into any coordinate system at any point I wish, right? So when I have a plane, I have a coordinate system where there's a normal component to the plane and two tangential components to the plane, right? And only normal stuff, stuff that is directly normal to this plane will go through. The rest will actually flow along, right? So if I'm looking at the flux that is moving through a plane, I'm really just projecting things onto the normal of any plane that I'm interested in going through. When those planes are coordinate planes, the normals are easy. They're the, our coordinate vectors are normals for the no coordinate planes, right? So basically my x component of velocity is telling me how much is coming through in x direction, right? My y component of velocity is telling me how much is coming through y directions and so forth. So if I'm thinking of basically what is the momentum that is literally enter entering through this plane into this block here, it's rho v, which is the momentum, times vx if this is x plane, right? Because the vx is the part that is orthogonal to this plane. So I have to add those two okay, sorry, but and I'm gonna get a conve convective momentum transfer. So basic basically this is 
rho vx is the x momentum that particles have that is transferring across y plane in this case. Rho vy times vy is the y momentum transfer across y plane. Rho vz is the z momentum transfer transferred across y plane. So this is my what this is what I mean by rho v vy for instance. And I would have the same for vx here and for vz. So when I put that together, I'm going to get a convective momentum flux tensor that is rho times all of these. So this vv is a shorthand notation for this matrix. So just notation. This is understood as matrix. And you're literally at every position ij, you are taking velocity component i times velocity component j. And this is our, what we refer to as a combined momentum flux tensor. Phi is molecular stresses, which are hydrostatic, dynamic, and then convective. So those are all of the contributions to the stress in your life, at least in transport phenomena for now. And other courses might be stressing you out in different ways, and we can express that with a different tensor. Nobody's laughing at my joke. I'll, uh, I'm, I'm not a good jokester on Fridays. All right. All right. So if I look at the, each coordinate component, phi i j, I will have pressure times what I call Kronecker delta, delta i j. It's one if these two i and j are the same and zero otherwise. So that's just a shorthand notation for elements of identity matrix. And then my shear stress, my good friend shear stress that we've been talking about since the beginning of semester and my convective stress, which is rho v i v j. Now we will put these to work in a specific example. <clears throat> so we have started, basically, uh, last time we really just introduced the problem. We're going to introduce a method for solving problems called shell balances. Our ultimate goal is to find the velocity distribution. I also need pressure distribution to fully describe flow. But for most of these problems, we're going to focus on velocity distribution and pressure will typically be relatively simple to find out or given as a uh, based on the boundary conditions. And we're going to focus on simple geometries. Now, a lot of equipment actually comes in terms of tubes, or I'm flowing between two parallel plates. Fractures in porous media can be expressed that way as well. Or I'm flowing in an annulus and sometimes around the sphere. Those are the main simple geometries that we're going to work on. Though, frankly, there's nothing simple about solving uh, flow around the sphere, as simple as the sphere might be. <laughs> so we're going to skip any details of actually finding analytical solution for flow around the sphere. We might just mention the formula. Okay? So most of the time we're going to live in between parallel plates in tube or in an annulus. Right? And those, you know, in petroleum, petroleum engineering equipment where they show up. So how do I actually focus on solving things? I'm going to, I define my shear stresses which are basically defining uh, anything that can change momentum. Okay? And I'm going, now going to take myself a little shell in a geometry, and that geometry will be adjusted to whatever it is that I'm flowing through, so that as many solid surfaces as possibly can be are also, also co coordinate planes. Right? So if I have a tube, then the geometry will be cylindrical coordinate system. If I have parallel plates, then some sort of Cartesian coordinate system. Okay? So basically that will simplify my life as long as a lot of these solid surfaces are basically coordinate planes in some sense. Great. And then I'm going to basically look at moment we have expressed as moment momentum. How does it transfer across coordinate planes? That's what basically 
I have as part of the momentum tensor, right? So we're going to then look and identify a little thin, what's referred to as shell, really a numerical cell in that coordinate system, like a little coordinate cell. In between, basically, you if you look at it at a point x, it's going to be x in between x and x plus delta x, y and y plus delta y, and z and z plus delta z. That's what I mean by a thin sort of shell in a coordinate system, little box, if the coordinate system is Cartesian. And I'm going to look at all sides of that box and see how does momentum transfer on all of those sides and balance it. And we're going to look at the rate of momentum change. So that's, if I have velocities, it's like in time. Mom so if I have velocity, that's what momentarily kind of enters my fluid. So that's immediately a rate. The rate of momentum change inside that little shell is essentially all of the momentum that's coming in through those sides of the shell, through the boundaries, everything that is leaving. And I will look at the action of the external forces. So gravity can change momentum. Okay? And that's what can change momentum. And I'm just going to balance that out. That's what we refer to as a shell balance. I'm then going to shrink that little shell to a point and get a differential equation to solve. It sounds conceptually simple. Devil is always in details, right? And the devil is in the details because you have to kind of examine the problem carefully and try to simplify as much as possible if you're going to solve the system by hand. Particularly, what we like looking at is systems where my only one of the velocities is non-zero, and it depends only on one other coordinate direction then my life can be solved analytically, okay? And that's essentially it. So in, in that case, you're going to get an ordinary differential equation. Otherwise, you're dealing with a partial differential equations, and most likely than not, you need to solve it numerically, okay? And of course, the moment you have a differential equation, you know that you can't solve without boundary conditions, and it's actually these boundary conditions that uh, dictate the change. So last time we introduced the following problem. <coughs> okay. So it was a steady state laminar flow of a Newtonian fluid with constant density. So my density is rho. Okay. I have laminar flow, that means that my flow regime is really ordered. Those are small Reynolds numbers. We have introduced uh, some Reynolds number in dimensional analysis, and we're going to introduce uh, more or talk more about them here. And then I have steady state means that I, my flow doesn't change in time. So that every time, every point in time, I really have just I just look at the physical point and velocity at that physical point is always the same. That's typically what establishes after I wait for a moment. I start the flowing and then have to, at, at the later time, hopefully I'm establishing steady state. As an engineer, you want to establish steady state. And that's what we can control. The rest is not easily controllable. And fluid is flowing down a gentle slope. And by gentle, I mean literally something like this. Okay. It's not like this. So even if I draw it steep, I draw it steep simply so I can easily differentiate things on a piece of paper. But I really mean this uh, angle beta is basically, my, my, my slope is very close to horizontal. So my beta is almost, almost 90. Okay. And I have a very thin film. And the thickness of that film is delta. And the... I am at the part of the flow where I'm not looking at any ripples that might form as I'm entering the system or exiting the system. And my velocities are all then parallel to the slope in this uh, very thin film of in laminar re regime. So I have denoted my, my uh, direction. So now I place a coordinate system. We want to place coordinate systems so that coordinate planes are parallel to the uh, to the solids. 
that we have, and my solid is this inclined slope. So I have decided to call this downward direction as z, down the slope, and orthogonal to it is an x direction. And I do have a y direction into this paper, but I presume that like everything is the same and sort of repeated in that direction, so I don't need to solve anything. So my simplification then, when I'm thinking about velocity field, is that Vz of x, Vz, this velocity down z, is a function only of how far I am from the solid. Okay. X direction, so nothing is falling into the plate. So x direction is 0. So now that I have only Vz and all other components, Vy is also zero, and I'm, I'm not interested in y direction, so I'm really in a sort of a quasi two-dimensional system. X and z are the only important ones, and z momentum transfer is essentially what we're looking for because I want to solve for vz. Right? So now I'm going to have this defined little shell inside, and I'm going to draw it uh, larger in the next thing. But basically, I have to look at the sides of this shell are parallel to the coordinate planes. Right? And I can look at the stresses that are acting on those planes. Okay? And I'm going to balance it. So rate of change inside, the rate of change will be zero because I have a steady state, I'm assuming. And then basically my zero is equal everything that comes in minus everything that goes out, plus the action of gravity that can change momentum. Okay? And that's going to give me then the change. So let's set up the shell first. So I have... So this is my z direction, x direction. So my shell is going from this is a z coordinate z. So the I'm going to just call it z. I'm going to call this plus delta z. So I'm assuming delta z is relatively small. In x direction, I'm going to take x and x plus y direction. We're going to work in terms of my phi. So this is my combined momentum. For any kind of directions ij, it had molecular stuff, it had pressure, okay? so pressure times, chron times chronicle cur delta, so pressure shows up only when i is equal to j. Then I had the shear stress component, so I had the hydrostatic components, dynamic components, and the last one was the stuff that flows in. What was the, that was convective? What was that? Uh, how did I calculate those? Vv something yes. So rho density vi vj. And I'm gonna I'm gonna keep repeating this, but this is suppose this is hydrostatic. Dynamic or viscous stress, and this is convective. And by convective, is literally what flows into my shell because this shell is going to remain in the same spot, but fluid might flow through, right? And I have to account for that. So, what are the components that I actually have? I have a coordinate system where I only have z and x, x and z. 
Okay? So I really will have two by two of these fees. Okay? So what is my fee x x? What does that mean? <clears throat> Which momentum is transferring when I talk about phi x x? X momentum across x plane. Yes? What is phi x z? Z momentum across which plane? What is Zx? X momentum across Z plane? And this is Z momentum. I'm going to shorten Z plane. Which plane is it? Z plane. <coughs> so, which momentum? What is going to come in this one? Z, Z. So, the normal one will come in. Yeah. Shear ones will kind of slide down. They're not coming in. Yes? And on the other side, well, this is a Z plane as well. Okay. It's coming out here. Plane is it's an X plane. So what is coming in through X plane? Stuff that is orthogonal to it. What direction am I pointing? xx here, yes, and also pxz. It's pxz that I'm caring about because I'm going to be balancing z momentum. Okay. And on the other end, I have pxz as well, just kind of coming out. So phi x z evaluated at, uh, at x, I'm sorry, not the delta x. And this other one, I'm going to evaluate at x plus delta x. So it's it's sort of like an orthogonal line. So when I look at the momentum that is coming in through these slides, Conceptually, and I'm drawing things as if they were positive in the coordinate system. They might be, I might be coming out on the other end for all I know, but then I'm just going to have a negative value there. So it's coming in is P X Z at X. That's this green one. And P Z Z at Z. And I have to multiply it by area. Basically collect because shear stress is always per area. To actually get what's totally coming in, I have to multiply by area. right? And this area on top, it's really just the length of the line. I also have it in Y, but I'm just going to ignore that. And that area is what? What is the length on this? Delta Z. 
and some sort of width where this is some width into y direction that I can ignore. Or I can leave it there and just divide by it later. There's just like so that I actually I need stress times area. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's actually the area where I'm accumulating. This is actually three-dimensional, right? Yeah. Yeah. So right? The area yeah. Okay. So it's actually, if this is my, this is my slope, okay? the plane that I'm looking at is parallel to it. And right now, you're looking at the projection of it, so you're looking at this part. Yeah? But into, <laughs> into me, <laughs> there's more area of this. And this is the width I'm talking about. So some width, it's going to just, we're going to divide by it. But I want to put it there because physically I need to multiply stresses by area. Okay. What is coming out? This CZZ Z and Z plus delta Z, right? It's Z and X plus delta X. So when I say E, it's typically the lower coordinate in both X and Z. The higher coord out is higher coordinate. That's what I mean. Right? Inward direction, so basically this is when I say in, I mean in lower coordinates, right? And out are the other ones. So these orientations in and out are understood with respect to everything's okay with WRT with respect to coordinate system. Cool. So let's now balance thing. What's coming in is C, X, Z, and X multiplied by the area. So that area is delta Z times W. Plus. evaluated in Z, also multiplied by them. <laughs> so PZZ is the other by area. So this first area is delta Z, the other area is delta X. Okay. So those are the two things that are coming in. That is the stuff that is coming out. <coughs> and now I'm just going to add the contributions of the external forces. What is the gravity here, or gravity component? So I have a slope. 
and my z direction is this one, my x direction is this one, right? And my gravity, well, it's down, right? So I gotta project it. And I gotta project it on x. So x, and this is my beta. Uh, no, I got to project it on Z because I'm balancing Z momentum. So Z component of gravity acting on entire element. All of that, after I balance it, is rate of change within this element. And since we have a steady state, it's a zero. Okay. So let me just quickly, so basically, if I have, in terms of densities, rho g, and the cosine of it, and this is my rho g, yes? So GZ over G is the cosine of the angle. So this Z component is rho G cosine theta. And times the volume of this element. Okay. What is the volume of the element? A volume meaning that I'm going to extend it in this Y direction to have the Delta Z times the width times delta X as well. Yeah. Okay. And I'm placing this W so that I have volume correct. <laughs> but this, you can see how this W will just. Yeah. Yes. So density times volume gives me my mass times g times cosine. Yeah? That's it, almost. Yes? Have you survived setting it up? If you survived this, then you're good to go. All right. So now we will divide by basically w, but we can also divide by delta x and delta z because those are the things that we're going to send sent to zero in the limit, right? And that's how I'm going to obtain my differential equation at the end of this story. So I'm going to now divide by delta x, delta z, w, which is volume of the shell. And I'm going to get, and I'm going to group things together. So I'm going to have the first CXXZ, X minus CXZ value of X plus delta X divided by delta X. plus Z minus C, 
So I'm going to now recognize how do we take partial derivatives? But it's gonna, it doesn't matter because everything kind of repeats into the plane. Does that make sense? So basically, when I take the partial derivatives, My partial x, partial x is the limit as delta x goes to 0 of x, f of x plus delta x y minus f of x y divided by delta x. Are we comfortable with this definition? My shear stress, x z and phi z z, both are presumably functions of x and z in this case. So this is just re recall the definition, right? So this is evaluated at x, keeping z constant. So z is constant on this plane, and this is x z, and x plus delta x, keeping constant. So basically, if I do the implementation, this is by notation, this is phi at x plus delta x, phi at z at x plus delta x minus phi at z at x, keeping z constant, divided by delta x. to zero to shrink this shell and I can recognize that this is going to end up be, being a partial derivative. Is everybody comfortable? This one? Whoa. So this is going to be partial derivative with respect to x of p x z. Yes? As I t if I take if limit delta x is partial derivative with respect to x. Yes? And the other one, I'm going to take limit gives partial partial z.
So if I take a limit when delta x and delta z go to zero, I will get minus ddx of dxz minus ddz of dzz plus rho g cosine beta is equal to zero. Why is the differential equation. So this is my Z momentum balance. Okay. Z momentum balance. And on Monday, you're going to start plugging in what is XZ and uh, phi XZ and phi ZZ and then actually get the velocity distribution, both shear stresses and velocity distribution. And it's a partial differential equation. <coughs> so, uh, John Lee, in, in the University of Victoria, he, he sent me one message to talk about. So you, uh, you had you taught one course last summer, and I needed to grade them. I know. Otherwise, I know. the students can't graduate. You're not going to graduate. This <laughs> one. And she sent me an email, and I've been so overwhelmed in the past few that I keep forgetting because I need to go and find those. I think they're just going to all get an A. <laughs> I need to tell them that. Anyway. Um, so, uh, next morning, uh, uh -huh. you'll have to have two meetings the same time? Yeah. Four. Yeah, let's okay. keep it at the same time. Okay. Uh,